Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the greatest show in town. <laughs> Art Basel, Miami Beach Conversations. This is uh, very special for so many reasons. Um, the title of the exhibition, uh, the, exhibition the um, conversation um, performance as repair is inspired by our, one of our speakers, Sarah. Thank you for beautiful. Um, our moderator today is Stephanie Bailey, who is editor-in-chief at Oculera and based between London and Hong Kong, and also is a curator of the Art Basel Hong Kong Conversations, and an um, admired colleague. Let's all cheer again for all of our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Annalie, for having us. And thank you, everyone, for coming um, to the final conversation of the year here at Basel, Miami Beach. Um, it's also especially moving to be part of Mary's beautiful program. Thank you, Mary, again. Um, and of course, I have to introduce the speakers very quickly because we have a big conversation ahead of us. Um, and I'm sure everyone here knows uh, these fine people on the stage, so I'll be very brief. Nato Thompson, Artistic Director at Philadelphia Contemporary. Sarah Reisman, Executive and Artistic Director at the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation. And Faith Wilding, artist and co-chair at the Visual Art Program at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And Faith is showing a beautiful uh, presentation of work at Anat Ebji Gallery at the, in the survey sector at Booth S3. So I really recommend everyone to go and see it um, in these final hours of the fair. So, um, to get right, to cut right to the chase, um, the title of course is very broad and we have people who are coming at it from very different angles. So we're gonna start with the, um, the inf inspiration for the panel's title, uh, which was uh, based on an, on an event that was hosted at the Rubin Foundation in October, um, organized by Sahabla Espanol. And it focused on the practice of two Latin American artists, Gina Giko and Ivan Sikic. And um, it was looking at the performative role of language, but perhaps um, I can hand it over to you, Sara, to introduce sure. this project. Yeah. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so the Rubin Foundation, as some of you may know, is focused on art and social justice. We have an exhibition program, and I thought it might be helpful to just talk through a lineage um, of our own thinking about it and get through that quickly so we can have a, a broader conversation. Um, but a few examples, we, in 2016, organized an exhibition called In the Power of Your Care, which was um, intended to think about um, or reflect on how, well, health and health care is a human right in our culture, and the, the kind of the gaping holes in terms of the structures and systems of health care, right, um, and policy. And so looking at how artists are coming up with, if only, um, gestural or conceptual responses to these um, lacks in the system. So some of the artists involved, um, the, a slide up right now is Carmen Papalia, who um, on an annual basis we organize programming around disability and accessibility, and so he organized a project, a, a workshop called For a New Accessibility Open Access, and led um, closed eye walks with all of the workshop participants, and the idea was to get people to think about their own relationship to disability and the built environment and um, how arts and cultural spaces can be m made more accessible. So these um, closed eye walks, he led them through Union Square to Madison Square Park. And so the idea was for everybody involved to recalibrate their sense of embodiment um, as a way of gearing up for a workshop about how do we think more um, in more accessible ways. And I have a few examples unless you want to jump in. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to jump in actually because, I mean, first of all, the idea of the closed eye walks, it made me think of the performance that Sikic screened, sure. yeah. uh, honoring the treaties, which was with the artist Paul Cannon. Yeah. Um, and it, that brings to mind this notion of movement, which comes, which sort of feeds into this idea of performance as repair within the wider framework of the program that you've been doing at the Rubin. Right. And I wanted to sort of bring in... Um, the project, uh, the, the exhibition that you organized, which you said actually comes, this is where the notion of performance of repair sure. came out of, which was the uh, schoolhouse and the bus. Yeah, so yeah, that's an exhibition that we hosted earlier this year and organized in partnership with the Art Design and Architecture Museum at UC Santa Barbara. And it's a, a show that featured um, the, the School of Pan-American Unrest by Pablo Helguera, a two, 2006 project, and then 
In 1999, uh, Suzanne Lacey and a collaborator who's a cultural anthropologist, Pilar Riano Alcala, um, organized a project in Medellin, Colombia called The Skin of Memory. And um, there's some images that'll be scrolling by, but Skin of Memory was a civil society effort um, community-wide in Barrio Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia uh, at a time in the 90s during, during and at the end of um, the drug wars. The idea was to create a, um, a kind of healing response for community members to be able to acknowledge those who had died in the drug wars, many of them youth. So there was a, um, the bus, the schoolhouse and the bus was the name of the exhibition. The bus itself was a mobile museum that could bring these objects, which were loaned by community members, honoring people who um, died in the, you know, in the crossfire. And so the idea was that people could come together in this mobile museum without having to cross gang lines, which this community, Barrio Antioquia, was still in that mode of um, it being risky for people to move between them. And in the context of that exhibition and working with Suzanne's collaborator, Pilar Riano Alcala, who's a cultural anthropologist, it was really um, wonderful to kind of hear her talk about how she saw the work that the two of them did together. And she used the word social repair. And so social repair to me, I think, I think we should work that into the Rubin Foundation mission statement at this point because it keeps coming back. Um, and with Se Habla Espanol, just to clarify Stephanie's uh, reference to them early on, that's, they're a group of four graduate students, recent graduate students from SBA's uh, Master's in Curatorial Practice where I teach. So it's four students who are um, Spanish speaking from Spain, from Mexico, from Colombia and Puerto Rico who came to me and said, you know, people think we, we're, we're dealing with the same things because we speak the same language and yet we're coming from very different places. So they said, we have this collective um, and I said, well, it called Se Habla Español, also known as SHE, if you, the acronym is SHE. And so the three of, uh, the four of them organized some programs and the last one was performance as a repair. And we just took it connected to the name or named it in connection with the exhibition that just closed yesterday, mm. Sedimentations, Assemblage of Social Repair. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer. No, it's fine. And I mean, I was, I wanted, I mean, there's some themes that have come out, care, healing, community, and domestic space. And I was thinking about um, Skin of Memory. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think about Orhan Pamuk's Museum of Innocence. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a modest, he called it a modest manifesto for museums. And one of the points was that the future museum is in people's homes, mm -hmm. which is essentially what Lacey did. And it was right. sort of bringing this personal into the institutional or presentative framework, I suppose. Like the, it, I suppose that's where the performative gesture comes in. I think, Nato, this might be a nice time to bring you in, actually, mm -hmm. because in the preliminary discussions around this, the title um, of the talk, you mentioned Simone Lee's Free People's Medical Clinic mm -hmm. um, as an example of something that you thought was representative of the title. So I wonder uh, if you could go into that a little bit, because I was very interested in the wording you used when you described um, this project. And you also mentioned Tanya Bruguera's uh, Immigrant International, uh, Movement International, and you called them performative gestures rather than performance, per yeah. se. Well, two things, so I'll just briefly describe. Um, the Simone Lee project happened about four years ago, 2014? Yeah, that's right, in the fall. And it was part of a larger project called um, Funk God, Jazz, and Medicine, Black Radical Brooklyn. And before I describe it, what's, it's, you know, so it's my favorite show I ever did, and it had the least amount of people see it. I guess that's just life. But um, it was the same year we did that Kara Walker project. It was like my platinum album. And then it was like, everyone was like, oh my God, I love Kara Walker. I'm like, how did you see this other show? But um, the other show was this one. What, what, the kind of underlying premise, which I'm very invested in, was, was how can you take an exhibition budget and have the actual money go to organizations whose values are in cahoots with the spirit of the politics? Mm -hmm. So rather than a project that's about something, it's a political economy within. So this, this project was about black self-determination. It took place in Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant, and it, we partnered with this incredible organization called Weeksville Heritage Center, which is, in fact, the embodiment of black self-determination. It was an intentional black community from the early 19th century, started by a gentleman named John Weeks that got fellow African-American males who, could, if they bought property, could vote in New York and thus began this intentional community. And this historic house museum emerged out of a post in 1968 that kind of brought it to life. And we partnered with them with this intention of thinking about black self-determination. It's all important because it undergirds a certain kind of space that gave rise to Simone's project, 
which was at this um, house owned and operated for a while by this woman named Josephine English, who was New York State's first black obstetrician gynecologist who also delivered all six of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz's children and really wanted to think about wellness as a framework to think about the community. And Simone Lee basically operated within this space in partnership with them to produce this kind of totality wellness center. So it was yes. both literal clinics, like there was checkups and health services and you know, there was doctors that offered their time and they did um, screenings. But there was also yoga, yeah. there was mental wellness, and, use, and particularly thinking about the history, it was dedicated to the history of the Black Panthers from the early 70s when they did these like uh, free people's medical clinics, they yeah. did these lunches, but in the spirit of that, kind of producing this social space. Now it was like, you know, it was only a month, that's why I call it performative gesture, right. because ultimately it wasn't healthcare. And I'll, I'll just, I just wanna say one thing to throw something out there, because it's on my mind right now, which is, um, you know, I'm like, like all these folks who are so awesome, you know, everyone's like really interested in like political social justice stuff. And someone one time, one of these snide haters uh, said to me, you know, the only reason this stuff even around is because you're so privatized that like right. under your neoliberal system, artists are like putting their finger in the dam mm. of no structural policy. Yeah. And I thought, well, there's validity to that. The problem is that's not a critique. That's a reality. And so, and I just say that because I want to open it up, but I was thinking about trying to contextualize this emergence of repair, of healing, in a world where the state's supplying nothing. Yeah. Like nothing. And you know, people, it's not just artists. Everyday people are filling in the gaps. Mm -mm. Community member, members are filling in the gaps. I mean, there was something that I found really interesting when I was listening to Simone Lee describe the, t the performance, and she said uh, there was, there were a few things that struck me. I mean, first of all, 100 people got acupuncture there, which sounded awesome. But um, she said that there were two antecedents, at the Black Panther Party's Free People's Medical Clinic, but it was also the United Order of Tents. And she said that it was a, it's a secret society of black nurses that have been organized since the 1860s. And actually, the project was staged uh, three blocks away from their New York headquarters. And she said something really, that really struck me about this. Um, well, first of all, they're secret, but she named and showed us an image of where their headquarters, or the building in which they have their headquarters. And then she, she also called their phone number, the secret society, and they said, hello, United Order of Tents. <laughs> She's like, are you a secret society? Click, what? Oh my God. So, and then she also said the suggestion of this performance that she had staged in Dr. Josephine English's house, which itself has seen many iterations as a community center, um, was the, that it was to go back underground. So you had this, and also what she said uh, was that actually the performance um, just really activated and reorganized everything that was already happening in this community. Yeah. So it was almost just a flashpoint. It was a sort of moment of revelation or a, a kind of apocalyptic um, exposure that would only last for that moment because it would honor and protect actually the secrecy that she was sort of proposing as an underground well, movement. It's beautiful you're saying that. And the other thing I'd say is, she was also keenly aware that a lot of African-American women work as nurses yeah. Yeah. and care and nurturing are a big part of life. I will say, I just want to add a, a kind of cynical note, not, not about the project, but, but the weird thing about it too, while we were working on that project, this incredible house in Bed-Stuy, where we were like, this is the embodiment of self-determined black culture. The guy who's running was literally trying to flip it while we were there. He's like, he's like okay, so here's, part of this budget's got to make this place a little nicer because I'm going to sell it for tons of money. And so there was this kind of like, I mean, we don't have to get the gentrification thing, but I was like, it's like either sh the slippery sand of neoliberalism was happening under our feet while we're, so it really was, it had to exist as this temporary autonomous right. zone of healthcare for a variety of reasons. Yeah. I want to go, but I want to come back to this point, but I wanted to bring in Faith as well, because I mean, Faith, you're coming at this from uh, having a history of performance and activism. Um, and so I wanted to, and of course, your, what we're seeing in uh, um, here at Art Basel, you have the excerpt of Waiting, which was staged at, um, as part of the Woman House project, um, which of course is related to the feminist art program. And I mean, I wanted to kind of ask, how do you understand this discussion on performance as repair, thinking back to where you started um, and sort of the work that you were doing in Fresno and CalArts um, with regards to 
performance as a very active form of actis uh, activism, actually. Did you see a distinction between the two? Because when we talked earlier, you said that, you know, the work that you, the activist work that you did with Suzanne Lacey, for instance, that was something that was happening even before arts in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, f early feminist um, activism came out of consciousness raising because that was the first moment when we actually um, spoke to each other um, intimately about our experiences as women, you know, and we were doing it um, Suzanne and I did it in Fresno because both of us had had experience with um, early feminist organizing. She through um, Saul, mm, what's his name? Saul Linsky? No, Saul with an A. Uh, sorry, anyway, Saul was an organizer, um, community organizer, you know, through these various um, organizations. And, and I had had a lot of experience um, being part of. Um, civil rights um, marches and groups and, and um, draft counseling and um, things connected to anti-war demonstrations and so on and, and um, so and then, you know, so we kind of entered the, the issue of feminism and how to um, organize um, women um, through these various sort of political experiences that we'd had and, um, and that we were still having. Um, and um, so when I was then introduced to um, Judy Chicago, um, when she came to Fresno because she wanted to teach a course um, just for women artists, women art students, um, they brought her to my house <laughs> and said, like, okay, here, here, you know, this activist, feminist, whatever. So, um, you know, the, and I still remember the very first um, consciousness-raising group we had um, in the feminist art program in Fresno. Um, well, the very first one um, centered on um, being hassled on the street. And um, so we all told stories about as women being hassled in public and on the street. And, and then Judy said, okay, go home and make an artwork of that. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> you know? But what came out of those artworks were actually interesting performance pieces. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of the second theme was in the consciousness raising, which in itself is very performative because you go around the circle and each person talks about um, what the subject is and you know, all of these histories come out. Um, you know, in the Chinese revolution, they were doing it, calling, calling it um, speaking our bitterness. So it was a way of raising together awareness and consciousness of that you are not alone in your experiences. Everybody else has had them too, you know? And, and so telling each other these stories becomes a kind of um, way of, of analyzing, mm. you know, politically. Okay, so it's not just personal, it's political, yeah. you know? And, and so this whole, idea of the personal as political, which came very much out of, you know, feminist movement. Um, and um, so, and, and we were just talking about, you know, the kind of violence um, that many of us had experienced and thought, and had never talked about, because you didn't talk about rape. It was too shameful, mm. you know? And so um, this this then led to a lot of performance work, which was interesting, you know, that um, when Judy gave us, you know, like, okay, so go and make a work about that. You know, what came back was all these performance pieces and installations. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, and, and we were kind of, you know, tapping our way. It's like, you know, is this art? Is this art that we're making? That was, you know, because we were all supposed to be art students at that point. Um, and so we kind of um, 
so this kind of grew, and, and certainly Suzanne Lacey, who was studying psychology at the time, you know, and, and I, who was studying um, basically English literature and art history, um, and a little bit of drawing on the side, um, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, now there's this whole other possibility, mm. you know. <coughs> I wanted to just touch on, so you did, you described the consciousness raising group as performative. Yes. So then how would you... Because performances directly came out of it. Right. And then so... All the performances at Women House came out of consciousness yes. raising sessions. <coughs> yeah. So it was a very direct kind of... And then you would say that waiting is a performance. So I, th I find that quite yes. interesting because I wanted to move in as well to yes, the visual art that you produce. Mm -hmm. and. Because one of the questions that I had, and I think this relates to, you know, the title itself and how broad it can be when you think about what performance is and, and what, it, what it produces and how it functions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about your visual work as applied theory, and I'm quoting you, based in research about contemporary social and cultural phenomena and ideas. Um, and, you know, Wall of Wounds is one example um, when you printed stains and marks on tissue paper that pushes back on what you describe as the numbing spectacle of pain, which kind of mm -hmm. brings us back to notions of care and self-healing, actually. Mm -hmm. So I really would love to know... Um, and also, you know, you're talking about the, the work that you were doing um, around education. You know, this, yeah. a lot of the, this all came out of a feminist art program, so it was done within a ped pedagogical exactly. sort of framework. Yeah. So what yeah. I'd really like to ask you is, you know, how do you see um, the relationship between the performative and the pedagogical and the performance itself and the visual? I mean, do you see all of these things tied together in your practice? And if so, how would you sort of frame it as one, if you know what I mean? Well, I can't frame it as when, um, but, you know, um, we are large. We contain multitudes, yeah. <laughs> um, to quote one of my favorite poets. Um, the, um, well, the, the example of the wound, the wound um, piece, which, was, which were tiny little Rorschach prints, um, I made a lot of them, in the, and I wrote a title on each of them, you know, like political wound, social wound, all of these, and then they were um, displayed together. And then people could buy a wound for $50, and then I sent the money to the Escuelas para de los Zapatistas in Mexico. <laughs> so they made, they made some, some good um, money out of that. Um, I, that's one of my favorite quote-unquote charities. It's not a charity. It's, it's, a, it's a love that I have for, for that, you know, so I, I give them money every year. But um, so the kind of, you know, the kind of pre reparative work, I think that the feminist performance that we were sort of inventing as we went along was doing was very, was very, obvious in a way, you know, it was very obvious actually speaking it out loud, you know, and performing it with our bodies um, in Women House, um, you know, the waiting piece and several other pieces were really about coming out of the consciousness raising and actually performatively, you know, enacting it, even though it was kind of, it was crude, it was, you know, it was not um, shiny, you know, or very, very, you know, it was very subjective and it was very, it was very there. And mm. people were just always coming and crying, you know. So um, it seemed to have some really amazing resonance. Um, and, you know, thinking about the very first rape performance um, that also came out of the feminist art program in, in Los Angeles, um, Ablutions, which mm -hmm. some of you might have seen documentation of, which was kind of a collaboration between Suzanne Lacey and Sandra O'Gell and, and Judy Chicago, and where for the first time, and certainly in most people's experience, the subject of women being raped was, became a public art piece, um, performance piece that people could come to, and you know they could hear, recordings of the stories of women who had been raped and then see this sort of um, kind of ritualistic um, um, action going on. Mm. And it was incredibly 
there was a lot of crying that went on. And it really, and, and for Suzanne Lisa, it led to a whole bunch of other performances, you know, like um, in Mourning and in Rage and, you know, the, the maps that she was making. So, and for me, um, yeah, I didn't really, you know, make performances um, so much at, at that time, and I was doing a lot of drawing and painting because I love to draw and paint, and I was kind yeah. of giving myself permission to do that. But um, I um, have done um, a lot of performance work with collectives. So I've worked with a CAA collective, I've worked with a Harris's collective, I've worked with a, my, my own collective, the name of which I can't remember at the moment. What's my collective Sub Rosa? Called? Sub Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> and in Sub Rosa, we did a lot of work. Um, our, our sort of our emphasis was to, to think about the new reproductive technology. So it's actually very connected yeah. to, to bodies and to medical work. And, 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 and it was also very instructional. And we, we did performances with that all over the world. We performed. I'm going on and oh, on. Oh, no, no, you're not, stop actually. Me. No, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to stop you there. I, was, I mean, I wanted to just sort of ask... I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask was, do you feel like your visual art performs? You know, so, for example, at the booth here in, in Art Basel, we're seeing your beautiful drawings. Do you, do you see a distinction, or do you think that they're just an extension of the performance itself or the activism that, that's, that, the perform that created the performance, let's say? I don't know. You'd have to ask my yeah. audience. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> I mean... I don't know. I mean, to me, everything's connected, you know, in my, in my head, in my mm. soul, in my heart, whatever. Um, everything's connected, and, you know, and to me, it's really important that people see my work. Yeah. You know, I don't want it to be, like, hidden away. Yeah. So, you know, and people come and speak to me about, you know, what they're seeing and what they're feeling, and, you know, so maybe that's reparative. I don't know. I mean, I think about that sometimes. You know, I've, I've taught performance art for a long time in different schools, and, and, you know, I think one of the important things always in this performance teaching has been that it's... People get very deeply... Students get very deeply into it, and they yeah. tell really dark stories in their performances that they have never told right. before. And so it becomes a form for them to enact, you know, a kind of revisit this in kind of a more p in a supportive place in a yeah. in a way in which you know we can share you know what what they're experiencing i think this is a, brings us back to the institution quite nicely actually and sort of going back to simone lee's uh, you. <laughs> you know this idea of the exposure you know the sort of yes. that temporary autonomous zone that exposure can create mm -hmm. um sorry can i, I just wanted to, to mention i seeing faith's image of waiting I mean, the, way, the Free People's Medical Clinic, Simone's project that you described, um, I think it came out of a story that Simone had seen on the news or in the news of a woman who waited in a waiting room. Yeah, yeah. I actually can't speak of it because I'll burst into tears. Yeah. But, but the question was, how long do we wait? Exactly. Or waiting, kill, actually waiting is, is deathly. It can kill you. Yeah. But you know, I, I do want to... Something to think about, you know, like when you do these social engaged art things a lot, people say like, well, wouldn't it be more effective if it went for 20 years and then everyone ri <laughs> r mentions like Rick Lowe because he did do it for like yeah. a long time, yeah. right? Right. right? And then you just think it's a tall order for you right. to work on one yeah. project for that long. But I do think, I do think, um, just to kind of be a little more pushy about it, you know, sometimes I think the performance nature isn't intentional in the sense that it's, it's the result of people needing to move from thing to thing because they're artists, because you, you can't stick to one thing because they don't want to start their own nonprofit. But it actually is just performance by default, yeah. rather often for some of these social engaged art things. Because I think for us, some of these artists, if someone said, hey, if we just kept this going forever, we took it all over for you, would that be okay with you? I'm sure many right. of them would be like, yeah. that would be great. They have no, yeah. there's no marriage to the term performance in it. You know what I mean? Like that, the, or the brevity. Because like with Simone's project, people came in and there was a lot of folks that were like, because it doesn't just start off with excitement. I mean, it's weird to get your head around what's going on there. It was like, 
it was like Star Trek meets like health clinic meets yeah. like yoga studio. So like it was a while, but then people started really figuring out what was going on. They were liking it. And then it had to go. I don't think a lot of people were happy it was leaving. Right. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, we understand. Now we're going to go back yeah. to our secret societies. I think it was just by budget, you know? Well, that brings in something, actually, NATO, that I've thought about a lot with regards to this conversation. And it was, and you did an interview with Prague Vartanian for Hyperallergic, and you were talking about um, socially, uh, how socially engaged art resolves a need for artists to say and do something, but doesn't necessarily produce substantial impact due to lack of scale or time constraints. So it's like simply the size of an art audience, or like you said, the budget. But I think that also, um, you know, raises that question of, you know, bringing it back to art and how art is gestural and, you know, it's not supposed to give the solutions, but it does perhaps offer ways into thinking about solutions or different forms of resistance. Um, and of course, this is the problem of the institution, right? The limits of the institution and what it attempts to do. And I think this is a really nice point to um, bring in uh, power in the power of your care again, Sarah, because, I mean, this was really hitting on a very important topic here. Um, and as you said, you know, the Simone Lee's project was inspired by a harrowing example of how difficult the healthcare system can be, or in fact, not even difficult, non-existent. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, Sarah, from your experience, could you talk about how you toe that line between gesture, performance, and action um, from the position of the institution, and, you know, how far can art go when it actually, com when it actually comes to enacting infrastructural or political change? So I think um, with the Rubin Foundation, we have the opportunity to do exhibitions and do programming that is um, time-based, maybe involves the process. I think part of what we're getting at as in this discussion about performance as repair is that it's process-based. It's not a kind of song and dance on stage and then it's over. It's like a longer kind of engagement, even if it's not for 10 or 20 years, like NATO was suggesting some people wanted. Rick, well, Rick Lowe has done it. But, um, <laughs> I, I do think we tow the line in the sense that we're able to give grants to organizations that are doing this work in the community, like NATO was saying, what if you could direct resources to organizations that are um, enacting values that are important to us, but also, or, or that advance community strength, right? I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not saying that so in the best way, but how do you strengthen communities in ways that are self-determined? Um, so we can do that through grant making. The exhibitions that we do always have objects in them, and that's something that has to do with our trustees and their interest in, the, in visual art, but there's so many opportunities to, you know, look at look to the object as a as a starting point. And I think with Suzanne Lacey's skin of memory, that um, these objects that represented people who'd either left Medi in Columbia or who had died, like to have a chance to reflect on that person. But and then an, an object prompts that. So we're looking at the bus outside the bus uh, of skin of memory. And um, yeah, I, I think that there. It's always moving back and forth and knowing that um, it doesn't end. I don't, I think a right. conversation, it's, it's always ongoing. How do we, how do we make change in the, through the work we do and how do we keep listening in order to do that? I think that's a huge part of, um, you know, if you want to think about reparative work in communities, we have to listen because we're not in those communities in a, you know, in a consistent way. So right. we have to, we have to be all ears, all senses. And it's also, I mean, in, in, when you're talking about art, I mean, it's always that kind of tension between representation and action, right. no? Which is, I mean, yeah. Faith, you look like you have much to say about this. I, and I, I'm, <laughs> if you'd like a prompt, um, I would, you have this beautiful quote where you said, um, the transformational, uh, you're, you've stated an interest in the transformational and pedagogical possibilities of a radical art, an art which, an art which uses beauty as a terrorist tactic rather than an end in itself. Um, and I wonder how, you know, does that fit with this question, what, what the challenges of the institution when it comes to action and representation and, and the symbolic, actually, and how you see this actually from your perspective as an artist practicing and embodying um, action at times, most of all the time. Well, of course, I'm stealing from the surrealists, you know, beauty must be convulsive, it must not be at all, um, you know, so, um, and, and when I say, you know, I want my art to be a terrorist tactic, you know, that sounds kind of terrible. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking also of Joseph Boyce, you know, who said, zeig deine Wunde, show your wound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, and this is how I kind of got onto the wounds, you know, that we all have 
these wounds. We have these social wounds and these, and these private wounds and these you know, personal wounds, but these collective wounds. And you know, so when I'm thinking about um, care, um, you know, I'm also thinking about healing taking care of wounds. You can't always heal everything, um, but you can care for, this is such a beautiful picture I'm looking at right now, talking about care, um, Simone's piece there. Um, you know, th this caretaking thing, I was just in, in Denmark at a gathering of the mother-nists, who are a bunch of mothers, and um, who gather from time to time, and they talk about the work of mothering. Because, you know, just as we were pointing out in bio, in um, the, the um, oh God, woman, woman's house, woman's house, um, the fact that, um, you know, that all of this work is done in the house oh, by women yeah. to care for others, right? Mm -hmm. To care for the family, to care, you know. And so when does the woman get to care for herself? Right. You know, and so... The waiting piece was also part of that. You know, it enumerates all of the things that, you know, this woman is waiting for as she's caring for everybody else. You know, so so the motherness, you know, had amazing, you know, um, examples of how most of whom are, you know, um, have careers and whatever, you know, but they have amazing examples of how how do we change you know, our social culture and our culture around, you know, the privatization of the house and, you know, and change it into community work. Right. You know, just like um, Suzanne is trying to do, like Simone is doing, like many people are doing, you know, how to create, um, yeah, these, these, these reciprocal and yeah. community kind of connections which are so hard to to do in these horrible capitalist right, times. You know, times that we're living in where everybody's you know just wanting to rip everybody else up not you know what would be cool <laughs> i was thinking you know how you go to ikea and you can drop your kids off and go shop yeah dude our basel totally needs the kid room you know Yay. i was thinking about that like i was thinking a lot of places do museums they should have one. They yeah, do? Yeah. They have one? Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Because I was thinking museums well. should do that. They well, need, I, like, you walk in, there's the ballroom. Because there's, like, all these innovations. Of, and the motherists, like, if there's these innovations for, like, finding a ways to, to take. I mean, gosh, there's been so it. many lessons yeah. that we could architecturally yeah. Yeah. include in future institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I think about museums, right? If they could embody yeah. some values, you know, yeah. it'd be great. I mean, I wanted to, like... And it's not hard. I don't even. I'm, it's, I didn't know our Basel had. Barely, I, I don't. I don't. I barely found this room. Are you gonna have? But like, <laughs> are you gonna have I'm, that in the kudos ICA? Kudos to you guys. I'm just gonna say. But NATO, NATO, are you gonna have that in the ICA? What's that? Are you gonna have that in the ICA? Well, we're talking about a bunch of stuff like that, like yeah. a kids' drop-off center. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. think they're basic things. I mean, I feel like if IKEA can pull it off. Yeah. I don't know if it's subsidized by the meatballs or what, but like. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I when IKEA has the lead, sorry, when IKEA has the leading values, and museums are like, "Wow, they're really leading the charge." What the, you know, like, hello? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I wanted to. There's a few things, Faith, that you said that I wanted to extend into the institutional frame: caretaking, mothering, and you said, um, "How do we share our social culture?" And how, and you know, I think one of the common sort of spaces we've been sort of thinking about is the house. And of course, the museum can be seen as a house, a house of the people, oh, right? If yeah. you think about it from that traditional sense, and. You know, Faith, when you were talking about wounds um, and collective wounds, I was thinking, of course, there's a massive schism at the moment. And I think um, this is a great time to bring in the Festival of the People, yeah. NATO, that you staged, um, which in a way I feel sort of deals with what you said when, when, you, when you were talking about the problem of scale. Yeah. So I wonder if you could introduce this, um, what you were doing, because it was almost an embrace of populism. Right, it was a populist event in order to really deal with the wounds that populism have somehow exposed, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, so that show, just for the record, we did this one thing, feel free to steal it, we did this ASMR <laughs> video festival. Do you know ASMR, yeah. Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response? It's like all these Instagram videos of people like chewing on food and like <laughs> whispering <laughs> and like unpacking. 
And goo making gooey slime. You know this stuff? Yes. No. no I do. No. Okay, so we had this internet <laughs> sensation. Yeah, not on and then bread face, this woman that puts her face in different kinds of bread. Yes, I that also I've know seen, her. Yeah. <laughs> and what does this do exactly? I, I missed Dude, it. Just get, you just got to follow the hashtag ASMR and your life will be changed. Now, what's that got to do with be care? It's only this. Like, we're embracing vernacular cultural forms. So, yeah. tattoo culture, comic culture, dance culture. And I don't mean arty dance, right? But, like, you know, like, when you go, like, here's... When I did a project in New Orleans one time, it was like a room like this, not like this, but you know, whatever, a room of people. And, uh, and I was like, hey, who here in this room is an artist? And everyone from two to 80 years old raised their hand, right? And then you say, who here is a contemporary artist? And the only person that raised their hand is the one that moved down from Brooklyn, right? And I was like, so what's up with this word contemporary art that leaves 98% of the people in New Orleans not in on the convo, mm. right? So I wanna come up with a tent it's big enough to keep those 98% in the room still. But it is, and, it's, and it is gets to care and populism because what I'm thinking through is like, how can we have a, a, a space of aesthetic conviviality that, that appreciates and reciprocates the different kinds of cultural forms right. that we are producing? Because it's not just about gender and feminism being the house, it's about race, it's about class, and everyone has their different cultural forms that they're producing yeah, exactly. that work within their own languages. And, and you know, sometimes even my, you know, even myself, whatever. Like I think all of us replicate these like discourses yeah. in a way that like I think all of us have bad habits. Yeah, yeah. Worth breaking, and it goes to care because you know, like there are forms that are, you know, like you're showing these slides of Meryl Adam and Euclid. I mean, the idea that like sweeping the house every day is a form of performance that's never thanked. Right. You know. <laughs> How many I'm, of us are doing that project? I want That's actually perfect because um, I did want to end as we began, um, because you've hit the nail on the head, this notion of difference in cultural forms. Um, there are different languages now. There are so many different approaches. It's such a different landscape today. Um, so I wanted to ask all of you, uh, is you know the title of this talk, Performance as Repair? I mean, for me, the performance was the real yeah. head turner, or is that the, I don't even know what the right phrase is. I would love to know how you would define performance, or do you think it's a useful term now to talk about the work that you do? Um, so this is really an open question. Sarah, you look very thoughtful. I wonder if you... I mean, I, I think perf most broadly, performance is gestural. It involves, I mean, it would involve some kind of audience. I think it's, um, as Vito Conchi had said that, you know, three, three people equals public, right? At some point, he said that. <laughs> I think it was on a city council hearing for Percent for Art in 2010. Yeah. Anyway, so the idea is, I think that there's some idea of like performing for an audience or for someone else, right? It's, I don't know that we... Um, and I think it's in, in the context of repair, it has to do with thinking about what is the social effect, what is the political effect of what I can do. Um, and that's right. very broad. It, there are so many specificities and I could speak of them, but you're asking us each. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. that makes me think about display, just the right. very fact that mm -hmm. the work is about display, then performance is sort of well, assumed. Yeah. And, and one of the questions, I mean, with Suzanne Lacey's project, Skin of Memory, she had shown it, it was originally staged in 1999, and then it was represented in 2011 in, in the Medellin Biennial. And then in restaging it at UC Santa Barbara's Art Museum, and then at the Rubin Foundation's gallery space, in the last year and a half, it was like, how do I present this? Like the question of how do you present this process? How do you embody everything? And I mean, can, can an audience, can viewers get everything from the project in a visual art space mm -hmm. or in a performance space? And I, I think, no, never, right? You can never get the whole picture. That's, to, to aim to do that is, pro is just not realistic. But right. I think there, there, there should be something communicated through the display. Mm. And actually, NATO, the, the Festival of the People was almost a, an assertion of the whole picture when, of course, you knew that you were never able to sort of tap into the whole. And... No, no, I mean, it's all... I mean, you know, I mean, I think it... <laughs> I was thinking, like, every, I have no interest in genres, per se, but there yeah. are reasons they exist. Like, my jokes about performance is, like, does it go on too long? Do people repeat themselves constantly? Like, that's my, like, okay, that's performance. Do you have to pay money to get in the door and sit in a seat? That's performing, mm -hmm. right? Anyways, but like, but the other thing I'd say is like a lot of the projects I've done with social engaged artists, 
like I said, it's I don't feel like I care about the genre. Mm. It becomes performance often by its like the impossibility of the the claim. You know, what I like is the poetics of assertion. Mm. You know, the fact that it's striving for a reality that you know, is unobtainable, but the goal was never to be, like, it's inherently going to be a performance, but the goal was not to fit within the right. performance genre. You know, I mean, we could even say, like, to go to the Zapatistas, you could say, like, that too was a performance, yeah. or all striving for revolutionary, like, Occupy Wall Street was a performance, because it didn't ever achieve its means, or, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like things that try to push against but it the norms. But it changed some methods, right? right. Yeah, that's it introduced yeah. certain methods, so there's, there is a change, but it's not but what about the there. Poor People's March? That was yeah. an incredible performance. I was there, so I know. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, public protest, yeah. mm -hmm. this is all performative. You know, having been a performance professor for right, many right. years, you know, I, I could go on about this forever, but I won't, don't worry. <laughs> um, but it, it, it has something to do with publicity and yeah, public, right. yeah. as well as movement, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it has, a lot to do with the body, mm -hmm. I think, as well as the mind. And it's almost like a kind of, you know, it's this enactment um, of, um, of ideas yeah. also, you know, or concepts, you know. Yeah. And so often there's like this really strong um, connection between the audience and the performer. Right. Um, you know, and they get, they get kind of, you know, very into it in a different way than they respond to something that's on the wall. Um, well, it's also about transmission, isn't it? And I think waiting is, is yeah. a perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Or visibility. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the reparative side, there's a need yeah. to make visible what is, you know, mm -hmm. what are the conditions in which people live, challenges. So, so then if it's not visible, we can't, how can we respond? Right. Right. Well, transmit. Uh, I mean, waiting is a great example because um, we were just talking about this earlier. Um, the script exists online, and so now there are YouTube videos of people performing face waiting. So it's it, the performance continues. Actually, it endures to this day. Yeah, it's not mine. It's by just the way. Trans so it's been it's, transmitted. It's then <laughs> it belongs out there. Yeah. You know, and that's the other thing about performance is that people perform each other's performances all the time. Um, and, you know, and kind of build on them. And I think that's really interesting, you know, that that's, um, you know, that, that young black men are performing waiting because that has, like, you know, I'm also thinking about, you know, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot done at Alcatraz prison. That was yeah. probably the most amazing performance of, you know, Waiting for Godot that ever has been and ever will be. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, this kind of, enactment, mm -hmm. you know, I think is super important part of it because in our kind of contemporary lives, we get so little contact, the flesh contact, yeah. you know, the kind of, the community contact, you know, it's all, it's all kind of, you know, modified by wealth and by, or by poverty or by, you know, what, what sort of, you know, job are you in or, you know, there's all of this distance and then everybody's on their fucking devices and that's even more divisive in many ways as well as, you know, puts people in contact, you know, it's very, it's very confusing in certain ways, yeah. you know, so I'm all for the body, I'm old fashioned, I'm old, so, you know, I'm going out with okay the body, yeah. I love that you dropped the F-bomb there. Um, <laughs> oh, I think sorry. it's a great way to <laughs> open that? it up. To, yes, you did. <laughs> um, so that's a really perfect moment to open it up to audience questions. I think I'm sure there will be some. I thought you'd said it several times, Major. <laughs> I felt like I did. <laughs> yes, we have one question over here. Could you just wait for the mic and then, great, thank you. Yeah, no, I have a question actually about, um, you know, coming to terms with the digital and its role uh, in performance, I guess this is a pretty open-ended, broad question, but I think on a number of levels, I think it's changed the nature of, you know, how the audience participates, and there's like a sort of nostalgia for this kind of purity where you you're, you could be at a panel and not on your phone, like taking pictures or a concert, not doing that. I mean, there's that kind of nostalgic approach, and then there's the sort of the effect it has on the pipes of transmission, the creation of an audience, and we're in a space where, you know, the 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 public, the public area is actually owned by advertising companies yeah. that mediate the yeah. tools of performance, the tools of gestures. Like if Instagram comes out with a new filter, people will use it. 
it was 98% of people in the room, some of them might be thinking about their funny bunny, bunny eared sort of like artwork that they made using something that was created by this for profit advertising entity. Yeah, yeah. So, my question is basically just digital question mark how has it changed <laughs> the nature of performance, the nature of gestures, and you know, activism in general? Are you asking me? I, I, I mean, Faith, you could definitely speak to this, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Um, I, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's complicated because um, people are now performing for others, you know, through these devices, right? And, um, you know, and, and, and the sort of the precious thing about performance was always like, it's happening in the flesh. You know, it's happening right there. You know, it's, it's the body, and it's all about the body, and bodies being, you know, enacting things near each other and together, and, you know, that giving you this, this feeling like, you know, hey, you know, we're united, we're together, we're, you know, we're... Um, so it's, it's really different. You know, I just have recently gotten a cell phone that actually works, Sort of. I think it works. I don't quite know how to work it, but you know. I, so I, I've been drawn a little bit into that world, but um, you know, I'm very bad at it. And it's and it's both. You know, if I can see my little newest grand nephew, you know, who's also learning to draw. He's four months old. So in daycare, he draws. You know, so I see his works every night. You know, and I'm like, <sighs> you know. But I know this child. I've known this child since it was born. You know, I've held that child. I have all of those memories in my body already. You know, so um, I, I know I'm wandering here, but you know, the enactment. Um, you know, in in ancient Greece, they had these ri rituals, and so it was the thing said, the thing seen, and the thing acted. There was those three parts that went into ritual. And I think performance comes out of ritual and, and, and is very close to ritual, you know, the kind of, all kinds of rituals. So I think it's actually, you know, that's why people are doing all these selfies and performing things for their devices and then setting them, you know. So it's like a third hand kissing. It's like kissing through glass or something like that in a certain way. But certainly one of the things that's wonderful, too, is that there's, on the flip side, I mean, one of the great things about the digital, you know, I've always been a fan of the, of the reproduced image and the, uh, this, the world of surplus versus scarcity. And, you know, the, you know, the myriad of cultural producers, to your point, has grown so exponentially, you yeah. know. I mean, how do you even talk about photography anymore? It's, it's a form yeah. of speech. Mm -hmm. and, 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 there's, you know, and just to go to performance, you know, people are also their own media channels. So for a lot of folks that have no access... I mean, it, there's a lot of access and yeah. communication yeah, and definitely. subcultures emerging profoundly now. Yeah. I've also thought, but the, well, the fun thing I thought about museums is, you know, you, we operate in different worlds, but museums and galleries, they are also in this way, I don't mean nostalgic in a bad way. They're this like, if, emo, if affect has a certain kind of need, mm -hmm. you know, people like finding space where there are other things happening than their phone, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally. Yeah. And it actually makes people being in a room together feel really novel. <laughs> which makes art experiences feel even more it's wild. Where true. they're like, what yeah. is this feeling of being in a room with people, <laughs> people. and exactly. weird things are happening? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't think, in, what I mean to say is, I don't think the digital necessarily takes away yeah. from the embodied. In some ways, it makes the embodied all the more wild. Mm. Good point, Nato. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I, you know, I don't see, like, when we did that Kara Walker thing, yeah, everyone's yeah. on their cell phones, yeah, yeah. but yeah. they were also in a room that smelled like sugar mm -hmm. yeah. with each other. Mm -hmm. like, and people like rooms to be together on their cell phones, just mm -hmm. go to a concert. You know, or... Sorry, you've been yeah, nodding I just, in I just don't think that, that um, I think they exist at the same time, but I don't think that the digital replaces the, the actual, like, our presence here on stage together. It would be very different if we were trying to do this in some kind of, right. um, like a Skype meeting <laughs> or a, Go yeah. a Google Hangout. I mean, I'm not, I, I understand your question and I think there are, there's so many more opportunities to experience through a mediated lens, right? But I, I think the, 
think of the relationships you have. If you only communicated with these people through the digital, it would be a very different experience. Yeah, but it is quite yeah. interesting because listening to everyone's answers, like I just sort of thought about how the digital is so personal. So it's almost like recreating that kind of dom domestic space we've been talking about. And it's sort of conducive to the transmission. Yeah. And, you know, pub performance is public by nature. It's always a display. So in, in many ways, it does mimic, you know, the publicity or the, the, that kind of broader media universe, let's say. Um, do we have any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Lovely. Hi, um, I have a question because I know Fates work very well and I'm thinking specifically about a series of works that you made in 1976 at the Women's Building with the students. And I was curious if you found a relationship in education to this kind of performance. Like, did you consider the making of these works a performance with these other young women artists? And does the works on paper that exist from that act as a document of that performance? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, yeah, because we were making it in, our, in my studio. First, we had to go out and pick all the leaves and find leaves. So there was a joyous discovery of, oh, and look at this one, and no, oh, look at that one. You know, that could be beautiful. And then we looked in the dictionary to see if we could find, you know, what those leaves were named. You know, because it was like about knowledge preservation <laughs> always in a way but um, but yeah and then we and then we had them all on the floor and we were all kind of you know adding things putting you know so so it was great it was really fun to, to do that together you know rather than being really alone in my studio and so I think the work shows the crazy sort of ideas people started coming out with you know and and little little touches that people added you know, it was really, really great fun, actually. You know, so it came out of the process. The, 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 end, the end product came very much out of the process. And process is probably the key word here, isn't it? Um, yeah. I feel like that's, that's all the time we have left. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here.